thing when we talk about how do we integrate livestock into a cropping system, you got to look at what resources do you have available. You know, the land, the livestock, dollars, and people. What, what's available to you? Because that's going to make it uh, help determine how you integrate those two. This is a little tough to see for in back, but this is a lot of our operation. Just to let you know, our operation uh, is located right outside the city of Bismarck. Uh, this is my home place down here, and we're in city jurisdiction. So we're actually, the majority of our farmland is in city jurisdiction now. And we have a native range. We have about 2,000 acres of native range, and that's true native range. It's never been broke up. This particular tract of land here, I tell people I bought it because of those rocks because I'd never be tempted to, to do that much work to break that land up. So I'm just not that ambitious of a person. So an interesting thing about this particular paddock here, my son teaches range management at the local college. He brought his students out. And on this paddock, in a two hours time, they counted over 140 different species of grasses, forbs, and legumes. That's the kind of diversity native range had before we screwed it up. We're also able to lease uh, about uh, 360 acres of expired CRP. It was land that was in CRP for about 20 years. It was primarily about 95% smooth brome. The rest was noxious weeds. We put water on that system, and now we're improving the diversity there. We have a couple hundred more acres of tame grass legume pastures. This is cropland that's been seeded back to same species, and you can see the amount of diversity there. And then we do have about 2,000 acres of cropland. So altogether, we're working with a little over 5,000 acres. We used to be larger. We used to be about 6,000. But as we've uh, vertically integrated our operation, we're actually shrinking the size or the number of acres. But we have more enterprises and a much higher profit now. So how do we integrate all of these? To show you, and this isn't all of our acres, there's a few outlined sections, but the blue here is the cropland, the light green is either the tame grass or expired CRP, and then the yellow is native, uh, native pastures. So you have to determine your goals, and our goals, I'm going to go through this really fast, but one is we wanted to practice holistic management. We got exposed to holistic management in our late 90s, really helps in our decision making process. We wanted to regenerate our landscapes. I'm working with a degraded resource. Our soils are degraded. I have yet to be on an operation anywhere in the United States or Canada that's not degraded. It just is. And so how do we regenerate those resources? The other thing that's important to us is quality of life. I was in the purebred business for 26 years, calving in February and March. Boy, I don't want to do that anymore. So no winter calving. We wanted minimal process feed and minimal amount of inputs, and I'm talking both on the cropland and on the rangeland. And then our son, who's 27 years old, is in part of the operation, has been now for four years. We wanted to transition the operation to him. So one of the things we're doing is we changed our production cycle. Instead of calving in February and March, we now start calving on May 15th. We're done by June 30th, and I'll talk a little about that. Now, to integrate the cropland, and these cover crops, the first thing we had to come to the realization is that we needed to allow for full recovery on our native pasture. I can't tell you what full recovery is here in eastern Colorado. Only you know that, okay? But it's different, you know, obviously Alan Williams was shown there with 45 inches of precip. I think that's about five decades worth, you know, but, but it's amazing. I can't imagine that. His recovery time is much different. Neil in Canada said he needs 80 days recovery time. We used to be a twice over system where we'd try and get through all the paddocks twice. We've now gone to a once over system and we've been on this for about five or six years now and it's working really well. I learned this from Ray Bannister, the gentleman in the middle, Ray Farms at Weibo, Montana about 10 to 12 inches of precip a year. So he'd be pretty close to you guys here. Ray, uh, Ray grazes his paddocks once every 22 months. He says he has to wait that long to get full recovery. He's grazing more livestock than he ever has, but the pastures are much healthier because of that recovery time. That's one of the pictures of Ray's there. That's a pretty dry environment, and yet 
it's amazing the production. It's like an oasis uh, of 10,000 acres there in a, in a rather uh, rough climate. So to integrate the cover crops, you got to find out what are your production gaps. Where do you have an opportunity or a need to fill in a gap, either with a nutritional a production gap or a nutritional quality gap? One of the things we did that helped, we went and charted our forages. In other words, when are those forages, the tame grass, the native prairie, and then the cover crop species, and I just listed some of them here, the winter biannuals, oat pea, brown midrib sorghum, grazing corn, or, or hairy vetch, the brassicas, when are they of the most nutrition? When can I utilize them in my grazing system? So this is just one of our systems. This has a lot of expired CRP, a lot of native prairie, and then we've integrated the cropland. We've also added this cropland here. So I'm gonna talk about how we integrate the cropland on this particular unit. This is a couple of sections, so 1,280 acres. Easiest way for us was to start with the fall seeded biannuals, because we normally come off with cash crops. You know, in the Northern Plains, we had a lot of spring wheat. We come off with that, or barley, oats, etc. We have time then to get a fall seeded biannual. This is one we're using. It's forage winter wheat, winter pea, hairy vetch, and then we put radish in there. Now the radish do not overwinter in our environment, but we put them in there to scavenge nitrogen and to help with infiltration. You'll notice I put bricks levels on there. I'm going to talk a little bit about this later. We bricks test all the time. Bricks gives you, it's using a refractometer to give you an indication of nutrient density. The average day of the gains on there are what we've found we've been able to get from our yearling cattle grazing that particular mix. Winter triticale, hairy vetch is a slam dunk no-brainer for me. I've been growing it since the mid-90s. I've only had it winter kill once. The winter triticale, I've never had the hairy vetch winter kill in our environment. We get really good gains and there's a lot of different things we can do with it as I'll show you in other presentations. This is one of the things we like to do with those fall seeded biannuals is we'll actually calve out on them. We calve late May and June. Our calves are left on the cow till March the next year. Because one of the things for our quality of life is we didn't want to do much work in the winter. So why wean those calves, have them in the crowd, leave them out on the cow. We wean them in March then, and then we, we turn the cows out on this type of, uh, of forage and they swell up like a tick. They can, they can add a, at least one to one and a half body condition scores in a matter of 45 days before they start to calve. So it works really well for us. There's just a picture of, uh, of uh, Paul had split that particular winter triticale, hairy vetch, paddock. And we don't move these cattle every day when we're calving. We'll only move them about once every three to five days depending. We don't set up a back fence so they can go back for their calves. We give them plenty of space. We calve out between 350 and 400 cow-calf pairs, and then we run three to 800 yearlings plus some grass-finished cattle depending on forage conditions. The calves are extremely healthy. I tell people, we calve two miles from the nearest corral. If that cow has a problem, she's only gonna have it once, because we don't get it. She doesn't have a second chance. Nature takes care of it or she works it out herself. That's all there is to it. Might seem cruel, but I tell people, our death loss is much, much, much less now than it was when we used to calve during the winter. In five years of calving this way, we've lost one female, is all. Do we lose some calves? Sure we do. But you know what? That's, that's nature. We don't have much invested in them. Now I'll tell you a little story. My son, who is 27, went to the university for four years, had a lot of friends down there. They were in the conventional production model. They were texting him. We went through a period of uh, three rough winters in a row back home, 100 plus inches of snow, and they were sending him pictures of all the, you know, dead calves, frozen calves, scours, mud, etc. My son, being the smart out he is, says, okay, I'll send you a picture of how rough I have a dream, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that's Kevin on our ranch. And I told my wife that after the first year we switched to this model, I should have to pay somebody to enjoy calving this much. It, it's just fun. It's easy. Works really well for our quality of life. Once we get calved out, we go to once-a-day moves onto the cow-calf pairs. And 
what we do is after we're done grazing, those fall biennials, we're able, if we want, to graze them multiple times. If you do a good job of rotating, you can get multiple graze off, grazes off it. But then we'll come in and we'll continue regeneration. We'll seed another cover crop mix. And what I prefer to call it is a biological primer. And a biological primer is nothing more than a diverse cover crop mix that enhances the life and the function of the soil. So we're going in with a lot of diversity. You know, I used to see two and three way combinations, thought that was really a, go re a reach until I met Dr. Adamir Caligari who talked about these seven, eight way mixes. And then I got thinking, you know, think of native prairie. What does native prairie have? A lot of diversity. So we're able, and I'll talk about this in my, when I talk about cover crops tomorrow, uh, or at the session later today, but we're able to accelerate biological time and integrate species that we otherwise would not have on our operation. So if we get moisture, then a month or so later, we have a very diverse primer that's ready to graze. And the beauty of this is we can integrate it and graze it with different types of species. The reason, one of the reasons you want diversity, you want to feed that soil biology a mixed ration. Because every one of those root exudates is different, like Dr. Clapperton talked about. The other thing is, think of it, the leaf shapes and sizes. All these species have different leaf shapes and sizes. We're maximizing solar energy collection. If you have a monoculture out there, you're only going to collect so much sunlight. I'm going to collect much more sunlight with a very diverse mix. The other thing is we can actually add species into this mix that cycle nutrients and help our livestock. We haven't used any type of parasitic control on our livestock in eight years. We use no dewormers, no forons. We haven't vaccinated them now in over five years. We just have no input. If the health of the livestock continues to get better each year. One of the species that's, that's uh, helped, we think, is plantain. That has some natural internal parasite mechanisms to it. And when we turn these cattle on there, if, if they tend to have internal parasites, they'll go after species like plantain pretty rapidly. So here's a warm season mix that we had seeded. Uh, it was actually a very diverse mix. I'm just listing four of the major ones. It was this mix I had shown earlier there. So there was about 20 different species. But if we're trying to grass finish livestock or get maximum gains on some stocker cattle, then we're going to graze it at a much earlier state, like, like this one here. And we can get two and a quarter up to three pounds a day gain on these uh, brown midrib sorghums, these C4 grasses. Uh, it works really well for that. This is a refractometer right here. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. We use that all the time. What you do is, this is just a garlic press, you take some of the leaf material, squeeze it out on there, put a drop of liquid on there, look through it, you see that chart, and it measures nutrient density more or less. You know, we use that, we want to, if we're trying to put maximum gain on livestock, we want to graze plants that are high bricks rate, because they'll have a higher energy content. If we're going through the grazing these cover crops, and I'll talk about this in another presentation, but we'll use higher stock densities, and then we'll move them multiple times per day. We'll only, when's a plant going to collect the most sunlight, have the most energy? In the afternoon. We'll move the livestock once in the morning, and then four or five times later in the day. We'll actually increase the gain a little bit on the livestock by doing that. Now, we use mob grazing. We're not like Neil Dennis. We don't do it all summer. We use it as a tool. I don't care if you're talking no-till, mob grazing, cover crops, they're all just tools that you can use to regenerate your resource. So we use it to our advantage. We also measure uh, bricks on all of our hay before we put it up because we want the maximum energy level in those forages. And with animals, if left to, they will select primarily for forage first. And you'll see that. If we're trying for maximum gain on the livestock, we do not run near as high as stock densities as we do if we're landscaping or grazing for another purpose. 
Now, if we don't want to gray stockers on there, we can let it go for a few more weeks. And that picture was taken right before a frost. This one is right after a frost. And I put this one in there because we used to think that our growing season was from the time our last frost in the spring till our first one in the fall. That short 120 days, which is about what we have there. Well, that's not the case. These brassicas, in this case, this is Winfred Kale, that can easily take a 15 degree frost. It's got to get below 15 degrees for several nights in a row before that's killed. By improving the resilience and the health of our soil, we've extended the growing season to now, it's not uncommon for us to have plants growing up until Thanksgiving, even though our first frost is around 10th, 15th of September. So we're able to extend that period of time that we can have a living root in the soil, feeding soil biology, storing carbon, etc., etc. This is then how we convert most of the cover crops to dollars. We graze most of our cover crops during the winter. You know, cattle have four legs, make them use it. I know a lot of cowboys would want to hay that when it's green, haul the hay away, feed it to the cattle every day all winter, haul the manure out, cows have legs, make them use them, you know. The beauty of this is their water source is right there. It snows in North Dakota, so that's the water source. We'll run uh, uh, temporary fencing in the winter just like we do in the summer. When it gets too froze, we'll just push it in the snow. Our cattle are trained to electric fence. It's not a problem. If they get out, they're just getting into more cover crop. We do have a lot of deer pressure because one thing, if you want to attract wildlife, plant cover crop. And we'll get a lot of deer. If we have an area where the deer are not yet trained to the electric fence and they're moving in from uh, long distances away, we'll use cable instead. So we tend to run cable then. We're not moving them near as often in the winter. We'll move them once every week to 10 days, depending on conditions and our quality of life. There was some good research done at North Dakota State. They tested these cover crops before a frost, and then they tested them in December. These are the figures from December. The radish in December still had a 14% crude protein, 70% TDN. Now, cattle do not relish radishes. They're not going to dig them up and eat them like they will a turnip. So I tell people, if you have livestock and you want to graze it in the winter, grow turnips. If you're strictly a grain producer, want to improve infiltration, go with the radish. This is hairy vetch. Hairy vetch will be 30% fruit protein, 25 to 30% during the growing season. 18% is what NDSU tested it at in December. So these calves here, these are some calves that aren't weaned. They're getting their fiber from the sedan grass millet. They're getting the protein from the vetch. And that's what it looked like. That photo was taken in December and that vetch is still green. Now it's not growing, but it's very nutritious for them. Millet, our millet tend to, doesn't tend to run quite that high. They had tested it at seven. I prefer to plant more of the brown midrib sorghum sedans. They'll hold their, their uh, crude protein and energy a bit more. So that's just some of them. And there is getting to be more research out there. Now, we can get a lot of snow and a lot of, of cold in North Dakota. Does not matter. The cattle need to be acclimated to it. We do not provide our cattle with a bed and breakfast. They got to work. They're here to work for us. And you know what? A cow would rather graze than be fed hay. They would. I just took a photo last week. I moved some cow-calf pairs onto some bale grazing, which I won't get to in this presentation, but that's where we set bales out let them have access to the bales out on hayland fields. And all the cows went into that new paddock, put their heads down, so the calves started grazing. And I got photos for, for a day plus till they got rid of the forage in that, the, the pasture in that paddock, uh, the hayland that had already grown. They were eating hay, uh, eating that growth rather than eating hay. They would rather graze than be fed hay. It can get really cold. That's not muskox. That's our cow-calf pears, 40 degrees below wind chill. I felt sorry for my son as I sat in the pickup and he walked out and took that picture. <laughs> now, I'm going to show you, with the time we have left here, this is some friends of ours, Marlon and Patrick Richter. They operate an operation about 15 miles south of me, and NRCS collaborated with them to do some research on moisture following cover crops. 
Because in your dry environment, one thing I know that's running through a lot of your minds is, yes, but the cover crop will use all the moisture. So what the Richters did, they went in, the, you know, it's about finding these windows. And they had seeded some peas, field peas, and combined those off. And then they went in there with a very diverse cover crop mix. Here's what it was. And in their situation, they needed to add more of the broadleaf, so that's why they were heavy on this. Uh, don't pay any attention to the species I'm telling you about. Just pay attention to the concept. The concept is to get more diversity and use species that you normally wouldn't use in your rotation. Recognize Jay there standing in that field? That's what it looked like then in October. Jay, do you remember when this was seeded? I want to say it was seeded at the end of June. End of June. Well, it was after the pea harvest, though, probably in July sometime. Possibly. Yep, second week in July or so. So here's what it looked like in October. What the Richters did, they brought in all their pears and they weighed them prior to put, putting them on the cover crop. So we had an initial starting weight. They turned them in on October 1st, brought them out on October 17th, and it's kind of a dual feeding system. When you, when you graze these cover crops, don't just think about the above ground, think of the below ground. What's your feeding below the ground? You know, you heard Dr. Clapperton and several others say at this conference, there's more microorganisms in a teaspoonful of healthy soil than there are people on this world. Oftentimes, the biology below the ground will out outweigh the livestock that are above the ground. So what I'm trying to tell you is you can't put livestock on these cover crops and let them graze at all. You've got to leave that armor, that protection on the soil surface, which down the road will be consumed by the biology. So this is what they did. They averaged 52 pounds a day gain, 52 pounds total on those calves, 3.1 pounds a day gain. They, we, I do not have on here the weight of the cows. That's just a bonus but that's a pretty healthy gain. So they sold their calves right out, up after this and took out their expenses for the cover crop seed and the seeding and they netted an extra $66 an acre. Okay, that's net profit after, uh, after seed costs and uh, seeding costs. But the most important thing was they got those cattle off of the native range so they got more recovery time to that native rangeland and then what about the value of improved soil health? You grew all that carbon, you had all those roots, you're increasing and improving organic matter, you're improving water infiltration, etc., etc. So that's not measured here. There is, uh, the photo on the left is the following spring right after Marlin planted corn into it. The photo on the right was, I don't believe that was Richter's, that was just a photo in the county, correct? It's three miles away. Three miles away, look at the difference the next spring. Now, which would you rather have? See, but that's why it's important. As cowboys, we like to graze everything. You gotta leave that armor. You gotta leave that protection on the soil surface. Now, NRCS come out and they did some sampling. They took samples in the fall. They took them in the, in the spring. They took it on a field. I should have mentioned this was a split trial. They had cover crops on part of the field, no cover crops on the other part. What it come down to there, this has to do with where the moisture was found in the soil profile. But look at the, the difference here between the cover crop and non-cover crop field, four one hundredths of an inch. NRCS has a real good program called Web Soil Survey. If you go on there, you can find the water holding capacity of your soils. Now, I realize you're in a long-term drought here, and it's not, you know, you've got to just grow biomass to protect the soil. But your soils can only hold so much water. What this is proving is you may as well use it to produce a cover crop, you know, and improve that soil health, improve that water holding capacity, protect that soil from erosion. Here's an amazing photo. This is a split trial to follow the next spring. On the left is where the cover crop was seeded. On the right, no cover crop. There's an extra, look at the weed pressure there. Extra cost, you gotta spend more for herbicide. This is just a win-win-win situation. It's win for the livestock, it's win for the rangeland, it's win for the, the cropland there. It's win for your pocketbook because you're gonna have much less expense than you do over here. So, now, 
other types of cover crops that we fit into our rotation. We have 2,000 acres of cropland. I try on every one of those 2,000 acres to grow a cover crop every single year. Now, on 1,800 plus of those acres, we're also going to have a cash crop growing every year. But we put our cover crops in either before the cash crop, along with the cash crop, or following the cash crop. But there is a living root in the soil virtually all the time on our operation. So many people say that can't be done. It can't be done because you don't have the mindset to get it done. So here's one of the mixes. It's, it's a cool season mix, and I just list the main ones there. At times, I'll go in real early in the year. If we have an early spring, and, and the snow leaves, which for us is usually 1st of June. Oh, I'm kidding. It's earlier now. But we'll go in with like an old E radish type combination, species that can handle cold temperatures. And I try for a lot of diversity below ground, too. When we think of diversity, we don't just mean species. We don't just mean warm and cool season. We got to have diversity of roots also. Different rooting depths, different root types. Plant diversity is the key for enhancing soil biology long term. So this is what that looked like before grazing. This was taken a number of years ago before we moved into a grass finished operation. But this is what that mix looked like right prior to grazing. Then we went in there, that's just about 700,000 pounds of beef per acre equivalent on there. Go in there with very high stock densities, very short amount of time. Uh, the movie showed this, this is a bat latch. People think it's so much work. I tell you, my son and I fight to who gets to do this every day. It's enjoyment. I mean, you know, you saw Neil out there on the quad. It's really easy to do. And we'll go out, it'll take us an hour, hour and a half every morning to roll up the previous day's five or six fences, set up the new ones. You just punch the time into that bat latch. Whatever time come, you want that to open, this little dial will turn, that bungee cord will fly open, the cattle move themselves. Very, very easy. Solar powered. Yep, they're solar powered. <laughs> My son has three degrees, hated college, came back to the ranch, and he calls that his day at the office. He's just setting up the paddocks for the day. It's, it's a pretty enjoyable lifestyle. It's been proven that grazing stimulates the release of root exudates. You ever watch cow graze? She ropes that grass, tugs, tears it off. When that plant feels that, it sends a signal to the roots to release root exudates. We've been injured. We need to regrow. Those root exudates go out, so a biology is attracted to the plant. You get more growth in that plant, and you get uh, more root growth, too. It's a balanced ration for the whole. You know, we're balancing the ration for the above ground livestock and the below ground livestock. This is what it looks like after high stock density. And all I'm really trying to do is mimic nature. Peter said it best in the movie where we talked about the herds of bison and elk and all those animals moving across. How were these prairie soils formed? Actually, you said that. I said that in the movie, but you didn't record it. Yeah. Thank you. So that's how the prairie soils were formed. We're just trying to mimic it with livestock. That's all we're trying to do. So after they move through, look at that armor I have protecting. Are my soils going to blow? No, because I have armor on the soil surface. Now, you're in a drought situation here. Things change, you know. Your first challenge and goal is just to get something grown. But you've got to get something grown. And then we continue it again. Continue regeneration. And we'll follow that. We don't use the same cover crops all the time. We have as much diversity in po as possible. So we'll follow this grazing with either a fall seeded biennial cash crop or another cover crop mix. And there's a myriad of species we can use. If we just have a short window of time, we'll go in there with a simple mix like cowpea, prosum, millet, buckwheat. In 45 to 50 days, I can have good ground cover, good growth on a simple mix like that. You know, don't think you have to have the entire year. And I can't tell you how many years. I've been no-tilling since 93, cover crops since 94, 95. There was a lot of years my cover crops only got this tall. This past year, as it said in the movie, we only, from, from uh, June 12th to the 1st of September, we had 3,800. 
Peter showed you in the movie the cover crop I grew on that. There was a lot of years I could only grow two or three inches, but it was six or eight inches below the ground. You got to start somewhere, you know. And I seeded quite a bit of cover crop this year in July that never germinated until it rained late in September, and then we got some species starting to germinate. But it'll never grow if it's in the bin. I would much rather take a chance of it being in the soil germinating than it sitting in the bin. Here's another warm season mix. This is one of the first ones I started out with in the uh, in the 90s was cowpea and sedan grass. Simple legume grass combination. Both warm seasons work really well. Now on our operation, we've moved into where we try to not seed any monoculture cash crops anymore. We bowed out of the uh, crop insurance. We no longer take crop insurance. We've built enough resiliency in our soil where I just didn't think it was a wise investment for us. And it was too constraining to us on what we could do. This is oats with three types of clover growing in. No herbicides, no pesticides, no fungicides. We haven't used uh, any pesticides or fungicides since before the turn of the century. This is a corn crop where we went in at uh, B6 and broadcast some brassicas into it. What we found works best for us, because of our drier environment, we go and actually solid seed with the drill cover crop the day before we go in and plant the corn. I've now purchased a corn planter on 15 inch rows where I'm trying to get that figured out where we can do it in one pass because I'm just cheap and I don't like to spend the money of that second pass. Here's what an end of the field looked like. You know, we had some moisture. This was two years ago. We had a little moisture in the fall. And once that canopy starts to dry down to that corn, you get all that uh, growth off those brassicas. And in the winter, this is the best way to feed cows. It's the cheapest way. We've significantly lowered the cost of carrying our cows here and running those cows by making them graze themselves, integrating cover crops into the operation. We lower the cost of production on our cows, we lower the cost of production on our cash crop because we're cycling more nutrients in it, we're protecting the soil, we're growing carbon. It's all about soil health, that's what it's about. So I went through that really fast to get done on time. So my other sessions will have a little more time for some questions, but I can take a few right now.